Hello, Radix community. This is Matt Hine, Chief Product Officer of Radix DLT. As many of you know, we're about to release Alexandria. Alexandria is going to be the first time that developers will be able to experience what it's like to build smart contracts with the unique smart contract language that Radix has developed called Scripto. Um, it's going to be a way of developers to start working with those tools and experiencing what they're capable of. And then following Alexandria comes Babylon. Babylon will be an actual change to the Radix public network. This is where smart contracts written in Scripto are going to be deployable to the public network, which basically means this is the beginning of the possibility of DeFi really running on Radix. So, there's a question there of how do, if once we have that capability at Babylon, how do we convince a world of DeFi projects and developers to, to come to the Radix platform? How do you create a mass movement of those projects to the Radix platform and make it successful and to fulfill Radix's mission of becoming the next platform for global finance? So going back to more than a year or so, we've been doing a lot of interviews with DeFi projects because we wanted to understand firsthand what do they see are the real problems with Ethereum today? What are the problems they're facing? What would they really like out of a better platform that would cause them to make them want to move to a, platics, a platform like Radix? So I've been kind of following on the coattails of, of Piers, our CEO's conversations. Uh, he's been talking with leaders of some of the most popular DeFi projects today uh, about DeFi in general. And this is all on the podcast uh, that you should definitely listen to. It's fantastic. Um, and I've been kind of following on those conversations as the as the chief product officer saying, hey guys, now that you've talked to peers, would you mind if I got a, a few minutes of your time to talk about what matters to you as a, as a DeFi project in terms of the technology, showing them you know, where Radix is going with, with Scripto and with our platform, with our scalability, all the great technologies we're building and find out, is it enough? Is this what you guys are really looking for in order to make a decision to, to migrate to a different platform? Um, and those conversations have been really, really interesting. Um, and in fact, there's been this picture that's emerged as we've talked to these projects, like every project comes from a little bit of a different perspective, but there's been this, this common story that's come out of this about what it's like to, to come into the Ethereum ecosystem, to come into DeFi as it is today, to, to, to write smart contracts, to deploy them, to run a business there. And it's actually quite common. Like the story is very similar between these different projects, even though they all come from a little bit of a different angle. And so, I wanted to explain that story. I wanted to tell that to the community because I think it's really important to understand what it's really like to be a DeFi project and how they make those decisions. What does it really, how do they make the decision to adopt a platform? Um, because this is the basis of everything that Radix is doing. We have to be successful here. So this is a little bit cheesy, but I've got a story that I want to tell. And I've kind of captured all of these, these conversations we've had into this story that's I call it Ethereum, um, Ethereum Island. Um, and I'll, I'll switch over to the other view here. So the, the story of Ethereum Island, it's, it's about the Ethereum platform and it's, it's this story of like what it's like to come into that ecosystem that I think is really informative. So where we're gonna start with the story is with the developer. So um, you have, well, actually where we start is the island itself. So this is, this is Ethereum Island. This is a little metaphor that I've created here. You know, Ethereum Island is a very exciting place. Ethereum Island is a place where there's lots going on. You can think of every one of these little buildings as a, as a, as a DeFi dApp. They can all t in connect with each other. There's lots of stuff you can do there. It's by far the most busy place uh, of all the different platforms today. Um, so it's pretty exciting. So a developer sees this and goes, ooh, cool. I want to be involved in this, right? So that's where the story starts. You can imagine a, a, a developer as, as a, someone that's considering landing on Ethereum Island and so um, we talked to some experienced uh, d traditional developers. So these aren't necessarily like crypto developers. These are just people that maybe for they're from the fintech world, maybe they're just professional developers. And we say, hey, you know, why aren't you building a DeFi today? And, and the, the answer got was, well, for the most part, they, they kind of got close to Ethereum and they took a look at it. They took a look at solidity and kind of the state of everything. They go, this is crazy. I can't possibly build anything of quality here. Like they just decided based on my experience, I just can't build things at the level that I want to build them. So that alone is a big problem. And it's something to keep in mind. Like already the developers that actually come to Ethereum Island and are building everything today have already gone through this filter. And basically that filter is you have to be sort of a crypto fan dev. You have to be someone that understands the potential of crypto. You need to be kind of into it, the, 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 how cool this stuff can be. And if you're coming at it from that lens, 
you kind of get over the tr the platform challenge. You go, I don't care. This place looks exciting. I want in. So they're going to land on Ethereum Island. So let's follow that de dev, the crypto fan developer who wants to to check things out. So let's let's take their story forward. And pretty shortly after they they land on there, they go, okay, building stuff here is actually kind of confusing, but at least I can copy the design of other houses. And this is something we hear pretty frequently. It's like, you know, the first impression with Solidity isn't great. It's like, well, it's based on JavaScript. Okay, I know some JavaScript. But when you really get into writing stuff, it's like, ooh, man, this is more complex than I thought. You have to understand kind of how to do things on a decentralized platform and deal with fees and all this kind of stuff. But hey, no problem. There's lots of code out there. There are, there are lots of places that you can look, at, look for in the Solidity community to, to show this is how people are doing stuff today. So cool. I'm just going to grab something off the shelf. I'm going to modify a little bit. I'm going to deploy it. Lots of people start here. But what we found is then after that, pretty shortly, the crypto fan goes, oh, man, my house got broken into. So they, you know, they, they copied someone else's house. They didn't really understand how it worked. And it turns out that their modification introduced a flaw, or maybe there was even the flaw in the thing that they copied that they didn't know about. But again, this is something we hear over and over again. The developers, they, they try to experiment, but because there's money at stake and because the tools are kind of difficult to understand, the, the language is difficult to really understand how these things would work, then pretty quickly they, they experience some sort of exploit of their control of their uh, deployed app. And basically they start yelling around to other people and that, hey, who knows, knows how, who knows how to build locks? Like, I kind of know how to build something, but how do I make it secure? That's not at all obvious. And, and kind of the, the, what we've heard is the experienced developers in the island go, oh man, newbies, they're always like this. And, and you know, behind the scenes, a lot of projects like their, their technical leaders will, will be pretty cynical about this. They'll say like, look, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of Solidity developers, but most of them don't know what they're doing. Most of them are, you know, they're just trying to learn the ropes. They're copying stuff without knowing what it means. And they're pretty dismissive. So, okay, let's follow the, let's take the story for a little bit. So. Three years later, something like this, the experienced crypto van goes, okay, now I know what I'm doing. This time I can build a house that's not going to get broken into. It's not going to collapse. Like it's not going to experience problems that I've run into. I actually know how to write this code. I've like, I've, you know, typically I've, I've built stuff over and over again, kind of through trial and error. I've learned from what other people are doing in the space. And I've kind of built this model of like how you can make it work, how you can, um, put on the layers of complexity you need in Solidity to make it secure against various kinds of exploit. Okay. So the direction is the experience developers go, cool, welcome to the club. You've now gone through what we, what we went through. And this is kind of the common story. Like it takes years basically to come up that curve. Even though you might be able to deploy your first smart contract in an afternoon by just by copying something and deploying it, to make something that's actually production ready, something that stands a chance of, of living in the real world and not being immediately exploited, it really does take multiple years. And this, this also is a pretty serious problem because, well, the first thing the C DeFi CEO does is says, hey, experienced crypto fan dev, do you want a job? And from the point of view of this guy, the CEO, the entrepreneur in this space, hiring, we heard, is actually one of the biggest problems they encounter. They they can find lots of different Solidity develop developers, but again, most of them aren't people they can rely on to say like, hey, I've got this great concept for a financial product. Can you build this for me? And have them feel like, yeah, that guy's going to be able to build it and launch it and it's not going to get exploited next week. Um, there are very, very few people in the space that have that level of experience. And this is a, this, what we hear from CEOs and, and entrepreneurs is this is probably the most important thing holding them back is they just can't hire enough people to build out the scope of what they'd like to build. So, okay. So let's move on. In fact, let's talk a little bit about the CEO. So there's trouble in paradise on Ethereum Island, even though it's the most exciting place to be right now by far. The DeFi CEO goes, hey guys, I think the island is actually sinking here. Um, and this is why we called it an island because we've kind of found that this is a common thing. Both basically, whenever we talk to these project leaders, again, sort of behind the scenes, they go, yeah, Ethereum is where the action is right now, but there's a real problem here. That problem is scalability, obviously. Like when things get loaded up, transactions start really running really slow. And even worse than that, things get really, really expensive. And this is something that anyone that spent any amount of time uh, in DeFi today is very familiar with on Ethereum. It's that transaction fees can range from, from surprisingly 
extremely high to stupidly high when when the network demand is high. Uh, you can get it crazy into like tens or hundreds of dollars to do DeFi transactions. That's a huge problem if you've launched a, if you've launched a, an actual application or business on this platform because that limits what you can do. It limits your audience. It means that if transactions are going to cost a hundred bucks, that means there's a bunch of people that will just simply won't use it because they're not trading in enough money for it to make sense. And it also just feels bad. Like who wants to be, you know, who's going to use a platform where everything you do is going to cost you 10 bucks or a hundred bucks. So they know there's a problem here. And basically know they know that Ethereum doesn't really have a good solution to it. They're going, yeah, if nothing else changes, Ethereum's not in good shape. As, as more and more adoption comes to the platform, the island is just going to keep sinking. And we have sort of this climate change refugee problem. You have a bunch of people on this island that they don't want to leave. They've all, they're all very happy with each other and they like the ecosystem they built. But basically the, the, the rising tide means that they're going to have to go someplace. So they're looking for solutions to this problem. Every one of them is like, we got to be on Ethereum today, but we got to think about where it's going in the future. So with that, Vitalik shows up and he goes, hey, okay, I've got an idea. This is going to help. We'll go to Ethereum 2.0. We're going to introduce sharding. And so you can kind of think of sharding as like some extra islands over here. It's like, you know, we're going to build 2.0 shards and you're going to have some more places. You're going to be able to expand a little bit more. You're going to have a little bit more room to grow on the island, but it'll be a little bit more convenient. You're going to have to kind of, you know, maybe you might have to take a boat to the next island. You know, shard, moot transactions across shards isn't necessarily as easy as it was with one shard, but hey, you're going to have a little more space to grow. And the reaction we basically get from the project leaders is like, uh, if you say so, like people are not convinced. They're looking at 2.0 and they, they keep seeing the, the schedule sliding out on 2.0. And they also see that, well, limited amounts of sharding that composes com that, that compromises composability and makes their life more difficult from a from a development point of view is not a really good solution. And to be honest, most projects I think are thinking, you know, unless Ethereum really changes dramatically, we're going to have to find another platform. It's not going to be Ethereum and, and Ethereum 2.0 isn't going to be enough. So this is the opportunity. And so this is where Radix comes in, you know, a challenger appears on the horizon. And so, you know, we might say, great, Radix is here on the horizon. We're this new island where there's, there's unlimited space to build and you're, you're going to have much better tools. You're going to be able to build better houses. Um, this is really exciting. So this is what we've been testing with these projects. We say, well, what do you think? What do you think about coming to Radix Island? And we got some really interesting reactions to this. So first I'll talk about the CEO. Generally speaking, the project leaders, the entrepreneurs look at, the, at, at our roadmap and what we're doing from a technology point of view. And they say, that's really cool. You guys are solving the right problems. You're thinking about it in the right way. But the problem is your island is way over there and it's empty right now. It's basically like the idea of moving their business to a whole other platform and moving to a place that doesn't have adoption is a real problem for them because they're making a business decision. Like they might think we've got the greatest technology in the world that's gonna be infinitely scalable and it's much easier to build smart contracts, but none of that matters if they can't actually do business there. It means, it means a lot of different things, in fact. It means, not, when I say adoption, adoption is, is not just there are users on the platform and there are assets on the platform, but it also means they need to see that there's actually like an organic enthusiast community of developers there. There's a bunch of people that are proving that this is actually a real useful platform and also provides a hiring base for them. They need to see that there's a bunch of people they can go uh, for the talent they can pull from to build what they want to build. And they also need to see what I would call code adoption. They need to see that there's actually people over there on this new place that are building code on their own because they love doing it, because it's fun and because they think it's a great tool and demonstrating all of the different capabilities that the platform has because they don't want to be the first ones to build something. They want, they, if, they've, if they're trying to launch a business there, they want to see that other people have written code that's similar, that's proven, that other people are making use of before they want to make that commitment. We've also talked to the to the technical guys, and so you know I'll I'll finish the story with their crypto fan dev. You know this guy at this point might have become a CTO, he might have become an engineering lead. Um, basically, he's working for the CEO, CEO, you know, and he goes, and he says, well, it seems like you've got really nice tools on there, but once again, I've already got this place figured out. I've already spent my three years coming up the learning curve. I already know how to kind of patch over this stuff. I might not love it. I might think, well, it would have been nice if I'd started with Radix years ago, but at this point. I've got a job here and I'm, I'm well paid because I'm one of the few devs that can, can, can do this stuff. I can't really make that decision. If my CEO says we're moving to Radix, great, I'll come along, but I can't make that decision on my own. So this is a tough position for Radix to be in, obviously. 
Um, and so the question is, how does Radix win adoption? If we can't, if basically, if we go to these projects directly and say like, hey, we want you to be the first one to come to Radix, this is a pretty tough sell because we don't have this adoption. We don't have this proven set of developers. We don't have this, this, uh, this demonstrated base of code. We don't have uh, all of the things that these businesses need to show that this is really a platform. Basically, this, they need to see proof that this is an island that more than ju that just them are going to move to, that sort of like the, the, uh, the, the consensus feeling is like, yep, Radix is the right place for us to go, and we're going to go there together. So how do we do that? How do we build that kind of adoption? This is a huge problem. And I think there are two ways of going about this. When you're talking about adoption, what you're really talking about is trying to convince a large number of people to go in a certain direction. And so characteristically, I think there are a couple of ways of going about that sort of thing. There's You can, you can build a flash mob, or you can build a movement. And these are two very different ways of going about it. The flash mob approach is saying like, okay, I'm going to just directly call a bunch of people and I'm going to tell them, hey, everybody, we're all going to be at this place at this time and we're all going to like, we're all going to do this particular thing. We're all going to do a dance together and it's going to be cool because it's going to be 100 people in the spot and we're all going to be dancing the same way and, you know, it'll show up on YouTube next week. Um, that's one way we're going about it. The problem with is, is it doesn't really scale and it doesn't really sustain itself. The idea here is that to make a flash mob happen, you had to individually call these companies, er, these companies, you had to individually call these people up and, you know, maybe you had to say, I'm going to pay you 10 bucks if you're going to show up at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of like, if we do this one thing, we're all going to get a little bit of exposure on YouTube or something like this. So you can get one thing done at a certain scale. You can, you can have that kind of event. And this is kind of the approach that basically every smart contract platform after Ethereum is taken because Ethereum got the first mover advantage. They developed the early adoption because they were the only game in town in the beginning. But everything that's come after that from, you know, you, you talk about like EOS or Cosmos and now Solana and Nier and Polkadot and everything else out there. These, this is basically the approach that they're taking. They're saying, we're going to raise a bunch of money. We're going to create a developer uh, developer pool, a fund of developer funds, and we're going to start paying developers out of that fund to convince them to come to the platform. And do we, taking that approach, you can get some good press releases. You can get some good launch events. You can say like, hey, here are 10 projects that have said they're going to commit to, to deploying on our platform. And then, and then maybe in a few months, you can say like, hey, the first smart contracts have launched on our platform. But the problem is taking that approach, it's not, again, it's, it's a flash mob. It's not sustainable and it's not scalable because you had to directly pay those projects and they didn't really come to your platform because they loved it, because they wanted to be there, because they wanted to launch their business there. You basically you paid them to be there. And once the funding runs out, they're going to find someone else who's going to pay them to be on their platform. Or, you know, they're going to do kind of the minimum they need to to get the paycheck, but they may not really feel like it's something that they want to spend their own time on and build a business that they think is sustainable there. So Radix has to take it a different approach because I think this is a big mistake that most projects have been making. Give me a moment. <laughs> so let's talk about movements. Movements are a very different way approach. A movement is something where you're not trying to organize a one-time event. You're not trying to sort of, you know, directly get a certain number of people to do something. You're saying you're trying to convince a huge number of people to all head in the same direction. This is what we need to compete against Ethereum in the end. This is what the real end game looks like for building the, the, the next platform for global finance. And the way you do that is not through a flash mob. The way you do that is, is you have to start with a small group. You have to start with a great idea or a great solution to a problem. And you have to tell a few people about it. You have to tell your friends, you have to tell, um, you know, your colleagues about it. You have to say like, Hey, here's a solution to something that I think you really care about. And those people have to go, yeah, you're right. This is something, this is a problem I've always had, or this is something I really believe in because it's super important. And if they have that feeling, if, if there's something real there, if there's something fundamental that's like, yep, this really speak to, speaks to what I care about, then they're going to tell their friends about it. And their friends are go, yeah, I agree with you. I also care about that. Or I also have that problem. And they're going to tell their friends and they're going to tell their friends. And so you didn't organize a one-time event, but if you can give it some time and if you have patience and you continually support people that are giving that message out there and giving them the tools that they need and and helping them tell everyone they tell that they that they know about this thing in the end you can get millions of people that are all heading in the same direction because they all have this shared belief and it's something that's based on what they really care about rather than you know what someone is telling them they should care about and and what they're being paid to say so 
a movement is the way we need to focus on this. And it takes patience, but this is in perfect line with Radix's strategy. We're, we're very focused on the long term. We're focused on not just DeFi as today, but DeFi, which is 10,000 times as big as DeFi as today, because that's the scale of global finance. In fact, I think it's more than 10,000. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back to Ethereum Island for a moment. So we've got a bunch of projects that are on Ethereum Island, and we also have a bunch of developers that are kind of floating around the ocean, kind of going, is this interesting or not, right? So what we can start with is a great narrative. We can say Radix is the most exciting platform that you should be paying attention to. It's got, it's got unlimited linear scalability with, when we get to Xi'an. You're gonna be able to deploy something here and it will be able to scale to any level forever. You're gonna be able to deploy here and be confident you're not gonna run out of room. You're not gonna have a sinking island situation like you have with Ethereum today. We can talk about how great are builders tools. We can talk about Scripto and the Radix engine and how those enabled a new asset oriented way of, of building smart contracts that's, that's both simpler and more secure at the same time that's really thinking about the right way of building finance rather than sort of the first way that the Ethereum came up with. And you can read the, the blog post that we've recently been, been putting up about this. So we've got a really great story for developers. We can, we can convince them to pay attention. But the big question then is what happens once they take a look? A developer is going to go. That's a great narrative. I'm going to go over and check that that place out here. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take a visit to to Radix Island and see what it's about. I can see the the sign on the horizon. It's worth me it's worth me checking out. So, what we don't want to have happen is this: when they come to the island, we don't want them to go. Yeah, I went over there, but when I got there, actually, you know, it was just plywood cutouts of houses. They didn't really have real stuff over there. It was just people that were kind of pretending to do things, and it was smaller than it looked. You know, it was basically all short-term hype. And again, this is basically what we see happening with most of the, the smart contract platforms today. They got a bunch of press releases. They, have, they talk a really big story about being all about developers, but what we generally find is developers take a look and go, yeah, it's fine. You know, if everyone else moved there, maybe it's a little bit better than Ethereum, but I'm not super excited about it. Um, and so, you know, again, if you're if you're putting a lot of marketing momentum about this, you can generate short term hype around this, but it isn't sustainable. So what we do want is a different approach to build a movement. We want people come to the island and say, wow, when I got there, there was a cool world community over there. They were building great houses. They handed me some really fantastic tools when I landed there. I'm going to go hang out with those guys on the weekends and have some fun. They're not even making a business decision. They're just saying like, I just like the way these guys are thinking about the problem. I like these tools. I like working with it. It's, it's enjoyable. And I like the community when I get there. It's like, these are people that, that, that have a similar outlook on the world. These are people that, that, um, that are you know looking for real stuff. They're not drawn in by just the crypto hype. <clears throat> we need to build that kind of what, what I would call incremental adoption. Incremental means it's sort of like, you know, you're not creating a big flash mob rush, but every time someone comes in there, they get added to that community and they stay there and they're telling their friends about it. And so incrementally you start growing that community and the bigger it grows, the stronger it gets and the more compelling it gets to the, to the more people that show up there. So <clears throat> this is a much more powerful strategy and this is the approach that we're taking. And this gets to Alexandria. Alexandria, as I said, is our next release. This is, Alexandria is meant for this community of developers. It's gonna be the first experience with this new way of building smart contracts. We call them components because they're so different. It's an asset oriented way that we think is going to be transformative. It's going to be a game changer for the way DeFi functionality gets built. Smart contracts are going to be way simpler, but just as powerful. In fact, more powerful they can be built today because developers are going to be able to build things more securely, more confidently, and get them deployed in minimum time. You're going to be able to bring developers up the learning curve to develop stuff quicker, which means a greater hiring pool for entrepreneurs. It means more confidence. And all of that is going to be that the initial forms of that experience are what are going to be delivered in Alexandria. You're going to be able to play with Scripto. You're going to be able to use it in a local environment with a, with a Radix Engine uh, network simulator. And you're going to be able to start building your own components, understanding what it's like and sharing them. And we're going to be doing a lot of encouragement of the community. We're going to be featuring community developers that are building great stuff. We're going to be supporting community developers that are building great stuff. And we're going to start with our own community and we're going to grow it from there. So that when we get to Babylon, so that when we get to the point where Scripto can move on to a public network, we want to have the best community in crypto of developers. We want to have developers that are working on Radix because, <clears throat> excuse me, because they believe in the opportunity and they believe in the quality of what it is that we're building and that it's real. So <clears throat> this is what we're doing with Alexandria. 
We really hope everyone else is going to get excited about that. We have the Alexandria preview event coming up on November 12th. We hope everyone's going to be able to uh, to join that or or join by uh, by by Zoom. Um, particularly if you're a developer, we're going to be showing some early previews of Scripto, and we want you there. We want you getting excited, and we want you giving us feedback to make sure that we're building exactly what you want, so that you can build the great next generation of financial products. So, with that. I'm gonna end this video. Um, thanks very much for your time. I know this wasn't a super short one, but we really wanted to get this across to people and um, hey, we'll see you on the community forum soon. Thanks.